But when I was a kid, I remember driving along the road with my father, and he pointed out this golf course on the right side of the road. And, and he said, that's a great golf course. And, and my dad loved golf. And uh, this was his passion, and he, as he pointed out. And you know, I was trying to look inside to see why it was so great, but there was lots of vegetation that surrounded it. And so there's a little hole here and there. I could make out a, a putting green. I could make out a sand trap and that sort of thing. And I decided to ask my dad, so, so dad, have you ever played this course before? And he said, well, no, I, I actually haven't. You know, this is, this is a club that's really very, very exclusive. It's for the very, very rich, which with huge initiation fees of, fees of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I remember thinking to myself, so behind there is another world, you know, a world that I didn't have access to, but a world that other people did. And similarly, until the time of Jesus, all humanity shared in this this lack of access into the kingdom of God. Our ancestors' rebellion in the garden had cursed the world and our relationship with God, obstructing us from his kingdom. And when Jesus began his ministry, he proclaimed, the kingdom of God is now at hand. And in his coming, he was offering humanity access to something that they never had before, the kingdom of God. So we're in the midst of a sermon series called The Kingdom of God is Here. Now, last week we saw that the kingdom is, is where God's will is fulfilled. Where God's will is perfectly carried out, there we find the kingdom of God. So in heaven... God's will is perfectly fulfilled, so you have the kingdom of God. But on earth, it's only here where God's will is carried out. Now, in this kingdom, God is the sovereign, and his subjects are those who are completely loyal to him. And like every kingdom, there is an ethical code for how its citizens are to, to behave. And if we learn them then we will become blessed in the kingdom of God. So I just invite you to turn in your Bibles. We're going to be looking at a portion of Matthew chapter 5 and of Matthew chapter 7. So Jesus' famous words of the Sermon on the Mount represents the most important and comprehensive statement about what goodness looks like in the kingdom of God. In it, Jesus says in 721, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. So even though that we're saved by faith, we're saved by faith alone in Christ and made subjects of his kingdom, we learn as we trust in him day by day to live according to his will. And as we do, He's transforming us into the image of his son. Now, this sermon expresses how God wants us to live. But how seriously can we take these words? So one standard Christian interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus has intentionally set an impossibly high standard. You know, it, it is so high. You know, he says things like, you, therefore, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Not because he really expects us to be, be perfect, but that he might show us grace for salvation. And as a result, what's the church do? The church focuses on getting people through the door in Jesus and that provides no clear comprehensive message for how we're to live our life. Because its most important text on ethics is merely considered some ideal that we're never supposed to attain to. And so it's an ideal at best, and at worst, a mystery. But how did Jesus intend us to take these words? What, what, is, what did he suggest? Well, at the very end of chapter 7 we find the most, one of the most memorable parables that Jesus you know, ever gave. And so th what we have in this parable are two men. And the first is a wise man 
who built his house on rock. And it says that the, that the rains fell, that the floods came, that the winds blew and beat on the house, and the house stood because it was built on rock. Now, the second foolish man built his house on sand, and the rains fell, and the floods came, the winds blew against the house, and the house fell, and it says great was the fall of it. And the question is, who does the wise man represent? Now, without looking carefully at the text, we might be tempted to say, well, it's those who put their faith in Jesus, right? That's who Jesus is talking about, the ones who put their faith in him. But look closely at what the text says in verse 24, that the wise man is the one who hears his words and does them. Jesus clearly is not talking about some impractical, idealistic statement that we're never supposed to obtain. His words are meant to guide us and transform our characters in the here and now so that we can withstand the storms that will inevitably come. For Jesus, obedience to his words is proof that we love him. In John 14, it says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It is also evidence that we truly belong to him. The Apostle John says in his first letter, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. And so what Jesus is teaching us is that to know him is an essential part of being in his kingdom and the proof that we really do know him is that we keep his commandments. Now, at first glimpse, Jesus in his sermon appears to be just reaffirming Old Testament law and encouraging his disciples to follow it more strictly. So consider the words of Jesus in chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. And then he says in verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now the crux of this material seems to rest on what Jesus means when he says that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Now it is true that Jesus says the law and the prophets will last forever, and they will. But they are not God's last word to his people. Indeed, the prophets and the law pointed to another time, a time in the future, a time when the law will be fulfilled. Passages in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, for instance. And what Jesus is saying is that his coming has brought to fulfillment that time. Now, the, the Pharisees focused on the action of literal obedience and forced conformity to the law, while the heart, the part inside here, the inner dimension was left unchanged. Obey the law. That's all you're supposed to do. It doesn't matter what's in your heart. Just obey the law. It's the exterior that matters. But Jesus teaches that actions don't emerge from nothing. We do the things that we do because that's what's in our heart. And therefore, it is the inner life that must be transformed, and then the outer actions will follow. Now, the ethics of the kingdom of God operate differently than the ethics of other kingdoms. So in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, for instance, so the legal system is based on Islamic law derived from the Quran and the traditions of, of, the, of Muhammad. And to enforce the laws requires um, laws such as this. So they have very strict laws, laws like this, um, strict separation of the sexes in public. So men and women are not supposed to be congregating together in public. The closure of businesses um, at prayer time 
So they can't stay open during those times. And traditional dress for women. And so to ensure that these religious laws are carried out, the, re the religious police patrol going up and down the streets wanting to, to basically report and, and interrogate anybody who breaks the law. And so fear drives obedience. But in the kingdom of God, fulfilling, fulfilling the law is made possible not by coercion, but by the transformation of the heart. And when we come to faith in Jesus, our old self is crucified. And we're given a new heart because we're being made into a new creation. And this heart transplant provides us with the capacity to live a righteous life. But we must learn to use our hearts correctly. And so the Sermon on the Mount is designed to train us to use our hearts for God's purposes. Now, let's see how this works out practically. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is an examination into the human soul. And it shows us what's going on deep inside of us. It moves from the deepest roots of human evil to the pinnacle of, God, of human fulfillment in, in love. It begins with murder, and it ends with the exhortation to love your enemy. And these are principles that are to guide our conduct. And as we dwell in the presence of God, we're given access to the resources of heaven so that we can apply them in our lives. No compulsion is necessary. We just live in faith and trust of the king through his spirit. Now, the last principle that Jesus establishes presents kind of the climatic conclusion of these guidelines. And he says, love your neighbors. And at first glance, well, that's impossible. You can't love your neighbor, you know, especially in a world like ours where, you know, people are just guided by self-interest. You know, the conflict is everywhere. We can't do that. So on October, October 7th of last year, which is very clearly in our mind, an Islamic terrorist group, Hamas, led a surprise attack against Israel. More than 1,200 Israeli foreign and foreign nationals, including 35 Americans, were killed, and then hundreds were taken as hostages. Now imagine if Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had responded to that conflict by sending a letter to the head of Hamas, and he wrote something like this. My dear friend, we don't much like what you've done to our nation and its people, but we've chosen to walk in love. We will not retaliate against you. We hope that this will calm any residual anger that you have toward us. We desire peace, love, and harmony between us, and hope and wish the same for you. All my love, Ben. <laughs> now it sounds rather ridiculous, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. So what would it look like, though, if we really did love our enemies? You know, as people who are serious about God, and if you're kingdom people, you're serious about God, we can try to, to reconcile words, Jesus' words, with the reality of the world that we, that we live in. Let's consider first why Jesus would call us to such a high standard. You know, have you ever thought about how much God loves all people? You know, scripture says God is love. And his love actually is spread out to all people on the world, in the world. Every human being enjoys the sun and the rain, for instance. Some places get a little more sun, some places get a little more rain, but his, the sun and rain are, are everywhere. Everyone enjoys the benefits of his grace. God doesn't discriminate between his friends and his enemies here. I mean, look at this country. He's, he's given this country so much wealth. Wealth is everywhere. We have plenty to eat. Can you say that the, the rich are God's friends and the, and the poor are God's enemies? Of 
course not. Because we know lots of rich people who, you know, who are enemies of God and lots of poor people who are, who are his friends. God's provision isn't targeted to those that he loves. His enemies are incredible beneficiaries of his blessings. In fact, according to Romans chapter 5, 10, all human, begin, all human beings begin as enemies of God. Every one of us. And yet the fact that we are enemies of God did not cause him to love us less. On the contrary, God epitomized the idea of loving enemies when he sent his only son into the world to bring us salvation and access to his kingdom. We all know the famous words, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But we could equally say those words as God so loved his enemies that he gave his only begotten son. When we love our enemies, we resemble the Father and display his likeness. Jesus says in Matthew 5.45 that we should love our enemies so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. And so we prove that we are children of, of God when we love those who hate us. But it isn't natural for us, is it, to love our enemies? You know, from the moment that somebody injures us, we develop a plan for their destruction. <laughs> we want to belittle them. We want to tear them apart. We want to hurt them 10 times more than they hurt us. At least that's who we are in our flesh, right? Love doesn't mean being nice to people and allowing error to go unchallenged. Love is not incompatible with rebuke. Indeed, all of Matthew 23 is dedicated to Jesus' rebuke of the Pharisees. And that's why the imaginary letter to the head of Hamas is so ridiculous, because it really isn't love. In the sermon, Jesus teaches that it is not particularly extraordinary to love those who love us. Benevolence restricted only to members of one's own circle is no more than what the rest of the world practices. It's basic human instinct. Everyone loves his own people. Even the members of Hamas do that. But the children of God are to be different because they love their enemies. Now look around for a moment. Any one of us can suddenly become an enemy to one another. It can happen so quickly. And when that happens, we begin to avoid them. We begin to exclude them. And it can be very subtle sometimes. But, 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 it, but it happens, and it happens all the time, even in the church. If you've become alienated from a brother or sister, excluding them that way is inappropriate in the kingdom of God. You're doing very opposite of what you're called to be as a member of his kingdom. If you've become alienated, you've got to seek reconciliation. If something isn't right and you know something isn't right, then you must take the initiative to seek reconciliation. If he or she has hurt you, then get together and talk through the issue with them. Forgive wrongs quickly. The longer you take to forgive, the more the hate will fester because you're giving access to the other kingdom, the kingdom of Satan, into your life and into your relationship with that person. As Peter wrote, love one another more earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. When we love our enemies, we fulfill the will of God. And you'll find something amazing when you start fulfilling the word 
of God, you'll find that the kingdom of God comes upon you. Like there's a spiritual power that, that kind of accelerates your life. I want to read something from actually King David uh, because he learned this lesson as a king. And he said this in 2 Samuel 23, 3. When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of the Lord, God dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. See, he knew that when he walked in obedience, God blessed his kingdom. You'll suddenly find grace to do things that you were never able to do because you're walking in the kingdom, the power of the kingdom. And the fruit of the Spirit will be evident in your life. Spiritual darkness will subside. If there's spiritual darkness in your life, something isn't right. Don't accept that. Don't accept spiritual darkness in your life and your family. You're not being a good steward of your life and your family if you are. But it will subside. And you will find yourself with an overwhelming joy that's inexplicable. The presence of joy is a really good sense of whether you're walking in the will of the Lord or not. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He really meant that. That wasn't, oh, when we die, that's what we can expect. He meant it for the here and now. That's the way the kingdom works. And in the kingdom, that abundant life is made possible when we walk in his will. You want God's blessing? Walk in God's will. That's the way that the kingdom works. Amen.